American Football League action is now in high gear, and routes and upsets told the story of this week's games. In Buffalo, New York, the Oakland Raiders met the Buffalo Bills, and many were waiting to see if the defending champion jinx that hit the Kansas City Chiefs last season would now strike at the incumbent Raiders. The once powerful Bills have been struck hard by preseason injuries and are trying to rebound behind a core of surprising rookies. Max Anderson, number 22, who is 5 feet 8 inches tall and weighs 178 pounds and is only 23 years old, is part of Buffalo's all-rookie backfield. Jack Kemp is injured, so the quarterback is rookie Dan Dara, 13th round draft choice from William & Mary. The rookies must hold their own and play beside the veterans, but there seems to be one rookie who already stands above the rest. He's Haven Moses from San Diego State who is captured here in a graceful but unsuccessful attempt at a Dara bomb. From the opening gun, the powerful Raiders dominated play and it was their defense that set up two quick scores. With six minutes gone in the first quarter, Paul McGuire punted to Oakland rookie George Atkinson, who caught it at his own 15-yard line. Atkinson's touchdown made it 7-0 Oakland, as he initiated a Raiders scoring avalanche as well as a personal onslaught against the Bills. In five punt returns, he gained 205 yards, which is a new league record. Minutes later, Gus Otto blitzed with the same results as before. Buffalo was forced to punt, and unfortunately for them, it was to be returned again by George Atkinson, the heretofore unheralded rookie from Morris Brown College. Pete Banaszak scored Oakland's second touchdown within two minutes as he ran over the flag from nine yards out. The defense had set up the first two scores, but now the Raider offense was to be really tested for the first time. There were many familiar faces, including center Jim Otto. But perhaps the most familiar was that of the AFL's Player of the Year, Darrell LaMonica, who linked up with Warren Wells on a spectacular 57-yard scoring pass. Raiders 21, Bills nothing. In the second quarter, Buffalo launched their first legitimate scoring drive with Minnie Max Anderson supplying the punch. His 45-yard off-tackle sprint put them in great field position. But like other drives to follow, the Oakland defense went to work inside the 10-yard line. Monica faking beautifully, Oakland started to move on the ground. Larry Todd carried past midfield. And then fullback Hewitt Dixon, number 35, rumbled in to score a touchdown 
that gave the Raiders a halftime lead of 31 to nothing. In the second half, Bob Cappadonna, number 36, tried to get Buffalo moving. Then it looked like the first half was repeating itself again when Ben Davidson hit Darrow from the blind side. But this time, all pro guard Billy Shaw was in the right place at the right time. Buffalo scored its only touchdown on a nice catch and run by Cappadonna midway into the third quarter. With one quarter remaining and trailing 34 to six, the Oakland defense must have been an awesome sight to the Bills. Ike Lassiter, Ben Davidson, Dan Connors, Willie Brown and the others, besides holding Buffalo to a touchdown, held them to a staggering net passing count of minus 19 yards. fourth quarter belonged to Larry Todd, number 22, a smooth-striding halfback who's been a second stringer behind Pete Banizak. <laughs> Oakland's message to the rest of the league is that if Larry Todd is playing behind someone, they must be a stronger team than ever. And last year, they were the best in the AFL. <laughs> Oakland 48, Buffalo 6. Two years ago, the Houston Oilers made a big mistake. They lost twice to the newly formed Miami Dolphins. Ever since, the Dolphins have considered the Oilers fair game. The first quarter in the Orange Bowl couldn't be fair with the score tied three all on a pair of field goals. But early in the second quarter, the Oilers passing game starts to click. Pete Beathard's use of his backs as receivers moves Houston to the midstripe. The Oilers won the rushing championship in 67 but had a poor passing attack. They went for receivers in the draft. Their first choice, number 86, Mac Hike. The rookie flanker comes through with Houston's first touchdown of the game. The 48-yard combination from Bethard puts the Oilers ahead 10-3. Miami takes over. Quarterback Bob Greasy is known for his accuracy. But Houston's forward wall applies the pressure and Greasy is forced to throw on the run. Number 29, Ken Houston intercepts and finds running room up the middle. The 66-yard run back gives the Oilers their second score in two minutes. Behind 17-3, Miami must get on the board. Houston kicks off after the touchdown. Bob Neff feels the kick on the goal line. Neff is gone. Almost. In a desperation effort, Houston Zeke Moore trips Neff on the five after a 95-yard return. What should be the break to put the Dolphins back in the game is stopped cold by another interception. This one by number 43, Jim Norton. The Miami fans are now getting restless. But the Dolphins stall the Oilers and regain possession. Greasy on target to halfback Stan Mitchell and again the Dolphins are in scoring range.
but Houston's division title rests heavily on their defensive secondary. Number 41, Larry Carwell, comes up with another key interception. This time, Miami does not get the ball right back. Pete Bethard sparks a new oiler drive with his 35-yard completion to Lionel Taylor. With his receivers blanketed, Bethard is forced to keep. He gets the first down and stops the clock. A minute left in the half, and Bethard finds Charlie Frazier over the middle to the one. First and goal, halfback Woody Campbell knifes through for the score. The three touchdown lead at halftime takes the pressure off the Oilers and puts Miami under the gun. Houston holds Miami until midway through the fourth period. Frank Emanuel picks off Bethard's deflected pass and the Dolphins have the ball inside the Oilers' 10. Rookie fullback Larry Zonka bulls his way to the one. Houston holds till fourth down, but then Greasy throws an unexpected strike to Carl Noonan. But it's too late to change the outcome of the game. The Oilers hold the Dolphins to a 24 to 10 decision. Miami fans will have to reevaluate the Oilers who are looking to repeat as Eastern Division champs in 68. Some people say the New York Jets lost the 67 Eastern Division Championship in Kansas City. The Jets were 5-1-1 one one when an injury to Emerson Boozer in Kansas City killed New York's running game and eventually their championship bid. But that was 1967. Today the Jets opened their 68 campaign in Kansas City with a healthy Emerson Boozer. But New York's running game is only to keep the defense honest so Joe Namath can pass. One of his favorite receivers is number 13, Don Maynard. The 57-yard Namath to Maynard combination puts the Jets ahead 7 to nothing. The Chiefs offense, basically a power machine, always presents a passing threat. Fred Arbanis penetrates Jets territory. Defensively, the Jets finished third last year. Jerry Philbin catches Lynn Dawson from the blind side and the Chiefs are forced into a field goal situation. With a ball spotted on the 33, Jan Stinnerud, the Chiefs soccer style kicker, puts the Chiefs on the board at the end of the first quarter. New York swings back behind Namus passing. It's a one and one situation between Maynard and Goldie Sellers and again Maynard is open. In close, Namath again looks for Maynard, but this time he's well covered and New York will have to try a three-pointer. Jim Turner from the 22. It's good and the Jets extend their lead 10 to three. In the closing moments of the first half, Emerson Boozer number 32 gets his chance to show the Chiefs that his right knee is healed. With less than two minutes till halftime, Don Maynard is again matched head-to-head -head with Goldie Sellers. The 30-yarder gives the Jets a 17-3 lead at halftime. After dominating the first half, New York is forced to punt early in the third quarter to Super Nat, Nolan Smith. Yard run back by Smith closes New York's lead, and so before the successful extra point, the score read 17 to 9. The momentum of the game is swung to the Chiefs. Boozer loses the ball. Number 22, Willie Mitchell recovers, and the Chiefs are in position to tie the score. But on third and seven at the Jets 16, Otis Taylor is stopped two yards short of the first down.
rather than gamble the Chiefs send in Jan Stinnerud. The 18-yarder is good, but Kansas City still trails 17 to 13. Again, the Jets try to change the current of the game, but again there is trouble. Joe Namath's pass is intercepted by Willie Lanier. The third quarter ends with the Chiefs in great field position, but still trailing by four points. New York's defense stands firm. Lynn Dawson tries a third and 11 touchdown bid to Otis Taylor, but it's too high. Jan Stenerud is sent in to salvage the drive. But the three-pointer still leaves the Chiefs trailing by one. The Jets must now move the ball. Namath connects with his tight end, Pete Lamons, when the Chiefs start doubling up on his flanker. Kansas City continues to double-team Maynard, so Namath again goes to Lamons inside Chiefs territory. On third and one, Boozer to his left, but the lateral movement gives Buck Buchanan time to sleeve tackle Boozer for a loss. The key play of the game, the 42-yarder by Jim Turner gives the Jets a 20 to 16 lead. Now New York must stop the Chiefs from scoring a touchdown. With only minutes left, Dawson's third down pass is broken up by Johnny Sample. Jan Stinnerud's 28-yarder is good, but still leaves the Chiefs one point short as the Jets play out the clock and hand the Chiefs their first loss of the season. In 1967, the Jets' title dream died in Kansas City. This year, it was reborn there. The Falcons, Saints, Dolphins, and now the Cincinnati Bengals have one thing in common. They're all recent expansion teams, which is an unenviable situation. No expansion team has ever won a game this early. But in Cincinnati, the Bengals aim to change all that against the Denver Broncos. <laughs> The first two quarters were scoreless and disappointing to both teams. While the Bengals and Broncos displayed solid and often bruising defensive strength, the offense remained unproductive. Several times both teams were within striking distance, but each drive ended in failure. Drew to a close, Bengal coach Paul Brown pondered his impotent offense. The second half was a different story. Cincinnati rookie Paul Robinson powered off tackle for eight yards on the first play. Then quarterback John Stofa threw to number 42 Warren McVeigh for a 28-yard pickup. On 
fourth down, Dale Livingston was called in to kick a 49-yard field goal, which gave Cincinnati a 3-0 edge early in the third period. Denver was soon forced to punt, and Cincinnati wasted no time, jumping to a 10-0 lead on a 58-yard bomb from Stofa to number 84, Bob Trumpy. With 8.58 remaining in the third quarter, the Bengals had the upper hand, but Denver fought back. Jim LeClaire, a second-year man from CW Post, hit Al Denson with a 23-yard pass. On the next play, LeClaire threw to Denson again, and number 88 picked up 20 more yards. LeClaire then hit number 32, rookie Garrett Ford, with a swing pass that was good for six more yards. But the Bengal defense toughened and dropped LeClaire for big losses on the two ensuing plays. This strong rush was the primary reason Cincinnati was able to limit Denver's passing game to only 106 yards in 35 attempts. The Broncos had to settle for a 33-yard field goal from newly activated Bob Humphrey. Trailing now by seven points, Bronco quarterback LeClaire hit number 44, Floyd Little, with a short pass, and Little did the rest. After this 16-yard pickup, LeClaire threw a five-yard strike to Eric Crabtree, who was open in the end zone. With the score now tied 10-10, the Bengals took over. Stofa hit number 18, Paul Robinson, with a 10-yard screen. Then the turning point came. Tom Smiley picked up a dramatic first down on fourth and inches from the Bronco 46. On the next play, Warren McVay was the only receiver downfield, but he was all Stofa needed. The 54-yard bomb made it 17 to 10, and the Bengals were ahead to stay. Denver's last effort came to an embarrassing halt when LeClaire lost control of the ball, attempting to pass. A few minutes later, rookie Essex Johnson from Grambling burst up the middle for a 34-yard touchdown and a final score of 24-10. In winning this game, the Bengals set an expansion team record and even it slayed at one loss and one very impressive win. It's a young season with the youngest team scoring its first win and the old champs, the Raiders, showing championship form. Houston bouncing back and the Jets ready to meet Boston. Also next week, the Oilers against the Western powerhouse, the San Diego Chargers. Miami will have its hands full with Oakland, as will Denver with the determined Chiefs. And Buffalo with its new coach, Harvey Johnson, will try to score its first win of the season against the Bengals. I'm Charlie Jones. <laughs> Thank you.